Welcome to Passion for Sound, the channel dedicated to thorough and honest reviews of headphones, earphones, DACs, headphone amps, other components and accessories. Basically everything audio related except power amps and passive speakers. My name's Lachlan and my goal is to explore and discuss all kinds of audio topics, even the controversial ones, to help us all find more enjoyment from music. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today a review that I know many of you have been anxiously waiting for, being the Burson Composer DAC here. Technically this is the Composer 3X Performance is its full name, and it's in the same line as the Soloist that I've got up in the rack behind me here, an amplifier that I reviewed here on the channel, absolutely loved, and ended up buying one for myself. So as you can imagine, I had high hopes for the Composer, and was really excited to see how it performed in isolation, but also how it performed in a stack with the Soloist. I'll cover all of that, including some comparisons to the Bifrost 2 and the stack against the TT2 shortly, so stay tuned for lots of what I hope will be very useful information for you. For now though, let's start as we always do with a closer look at the Burson Composer. Just like the Soloist headphone amplifier, the Composer retails for $1,144 US dollars or about $1,700 Australian dollars. So it's not a cheap DAC by any means, but it's also not in any sort of crazy flagship super duper level price points of things like the TT2 that I mentioned earlier. So it's what I would call at the upper end of affordable territory without going into aspirational territory, I guess you could say. The Composer is built on the ESS9038 DAC chip, which is a very high quality DAC chip from Sabre. It allows all kinds of different formats, everything from MP3 through FLAC and other PCM files, all the way through to DSD512. So pretty much anything you could ever think to send to this, it's going to be able to decode it. As part of the overall circuit to turn your digital files into sweet, sweet music, it uses four of Burson's own V6 Vivid op amps. So they're an op amp, but they're a discrete op amp, and I've covered them off in separate reviews. I've also mentioned them a little bit in my soloist review. So in the case of the Composer, you can swap out op amps, but for this review, I've chosen not to talk about op amp rolling because my experience with the soloist showed me that the V6 Vivids are the right choice of op amps for the Burson Soloist, and I'm assuming therefore the Composer line. Based on what I heard, I felt that there was no benefit in trying different op amps. I wouldn't have wanted to go to the classics, which are a bit smoother and thicker sounding, because to me, the tonality of this was just right in terms of smoothness without adding extra thickness from the classics. So I haven't done that. I apologize for those that were looking for that, but my recommendation would be to stick with the Vivids in this one. The one alternative might be the Sparkos Labs op amps, but I don't have enough of them here for me to test that theory out. One more thing I want to mention before we start looking at the features and functions and buttons and whatnot is that the Composer uses the same power supply technology as the Soloist and also the conductor for those familiar with the conductor. And what that means is it takes a switch mode power supply feeding into the amp but then converts that power supply to a much higher frequency that takes any noise from the power supply outside of human hearing range. So the idea is it produces extremely clean power that's not going to affect the listening experience. Now obviously I can't compare how this sounds with and without that because it's all built in, but the result of this in the case of the Soloist and again in the Composer is an overall very clean sound with no sense of noise. Before we get into sound quality though, let's look at the front and back panels and what the features and functions are from an external point of view. On the front panel here, we've got nothing much to talk about. We've got a power button over on this side. We've got a volume knob and also a menu selector. So there's got a click button there. So the clicking button will mute the output if you're using this as a preamp. And it will also allow you to select things within the menu, which I'll show you on screen shortly. We've got the menu button here that's gonna open and close the menu. And of course, we've got our display. The other thing you might see here is a window for the remote control. And I'll talk a bit more about the remote control in just a minute. Before we get there though, let's take a look at the back. 
So on the back, we've got a Bluetooth aerial. So this will receive Aptex HD Bluetooth up to 96 kilohertz, I believe but that doesn't mean it's lossless. So do be aware of that. It will receive higher res Bluetooth, but the Bluetooth transmission protocols, as I understand it, are still not lossless. So you're not gonna get the same performance in this with Bluetooth as you will for a wired connection. It's great to have the convenience of Bluetooth, but I just didn't want you thinking you could have a fully wireless DAC with no cost in sound quality. We're not quite there yet, unfortunately. Continuing along the back panel, we've got our three different digital inputs. We've got USB-C, and yes, that is USB-C. We've got optical and we've got coaxial. So obviously this means for those of you that believe in high-end USB cables, and I'm not gonna get into the debate about whether it is or it isn't better for this video, but if you do believe in high-end USB cables, you will need to invest in a USB-C one to get the most out of the composer if that's what you're looking for. I'll talk about what I heard when comparing these three inputs in just a moment, but before we do, let's finish our tour of the back panel with the RCAs and the XLRs. So these are the two different outputs you can use, both run concurrently and can be either a fixed output or a variable preamp output. One point I want to make here, and this carries through to the Soloist, but is something I forgot to mention in the Soloist review, and that is that for some reason, Burson don't label their outputs for the XLRs, which is a bit of a shame. Now, it doesn't take long to work out which one's which, but it can mean a bit of cable swapping to get it right. For those of you with Burson products, the right output is the one to the left when you're looking at the back panel. So it always runs right left on the back. Like I said, it's a bit of a shame that they haven't printed it on there, but it's also one of those things that once you get it set up, you're very rarely going to look at it again. So it's not a big deal, but it would be nice to have it on there. If we flip back around to the front now, let's talk a bit about just a couple of minor details I want to cover off before we get into some of the sound quality like the sound of the inputs, the sound of the outputs, the sound of the preamp versus DAC mode, all those sorts of things. But before we do, this display here on the front gives you lots of access to different information, including the menu system. There are a couple of things I want to talk about with that. First and foremost, when it's on, it's going to show you three lines of information. It's going to show you what the input is, so USB, coax, etc., what the mode is, whether it's in preamp or DAC mode, and finally, what the sample rate is. Now, I contacted Burson about this because when I got the unit, I noticed that the sample rate icon kind of flickers a little bit from time to time. You may or may not be able to see it in the video because of the frame rates of the recording, but it just flickers on and off really, really fast every now and then. Burson's answer to this was that that icon is directly connected to and reflective of the regular polling that the DAC does to check the sample rate. So the fact that it's flicking every now and again tells you that the DAC is constantly monitoring to make sure it's set to the right sample rate mode. After a while, the flickering becomes irrelevant and you don't even notice it anymore, but it was something out of the box that I thought might have been a fault. What I now understand is it's not a fault. I don't necessarily see it as a benefit, but it's not a fault. While we're talking to display, I do also want to mention the menu system on this. There's lots of different choices available to you, but most of them you shouldn't really change. I think it's fantastic that Burson have opened up all of the functionality of the Sabre DAC chip, including all the filters, the emphasis, de-emphasis, all that stuff is available to you should you want to tweak and play with it. But the reality is most things should be set in their default settings because that's going to be the best performance. To briefly talk you through what the options are though, you've got gain modes of high and low, you've got the preamp or the DAC only mode, which will either enable or disable the volume control from the composer. I'll talk more about that soon. You've also got the ability to change through all the different filters that are available. I'll talk about those shortly as well. And then you can also look at things like the emphasis or de-emphasis mode, which realistically should be left off unless you're using a cassette deck that uses noise reduction. And I don't know how that would work because cassette decks aren't digital. But anyway, that's how it's designed is for only things using noise reduction, which our sources generally are not going to be doing. So that should be left off. And then you've got other things like how well it's locking to the signal and preventing jitter, which again, you should leave in the default setting unless you're having problems. So in reality, if you're playing around with the menu of this, the thing you're likely to be doing is changing gain mode, changing between DAC and preamp mode, and changing filters. Everything else you should leave alone. You can play with it, you're not going to do any damage to it if you do, but there's likely not going to be any sonic benefit, and more likely there's going to be sonic degradation. Enjoying this video? If you are and you'd like to help me make more videos like this one, there are lots of ways you can help and most of them don't cost you a cent. You can help for free by liking this video, subscribing and ringing the bell, sharing this video on social media or your favorite audio forums, or by making your next purchases using any of the affiliate links in the description. Obviously that's not technically free, but you're not spending anything extra and it all helps out. 
Want to go a step further? You could buy some merchandise, t-shirt, hoodies, caps and the like, or you can join the Passion for Sound family on Patreon. It's a growing community with plenty of interesting discussion and your chance to influence what happens on the channel. Check out the description for more information and links where relevant. But for now, let's get back to the video. So with all that in mind, let's start talking sound quality and I'm going to start specifically by talking about some different sound quality variations from the back of the device. Firstly, we're going to talk about the different sound quality from the different inputs. So even though these are all digital inputs, they all sound quite a bit different. To test this, I was listening to We Real Cool by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And what I found as I moved through the three different connections, actually I should go back a step, the way I set this up was I had USB directly from my computer. I then had optical and coax running from a Raspberry Pi using a Hi-Fi Berry Digi Plus board. So high quality audio streamed through the network. It's all wired connection from my computer through to the Raspberry Pi. So in theory, it should be just as good as the USB, if not better. And what I heard was that if I use the USB as kind of the baseline, the optical sounded drier, not quite as enjoyable to me at least. It had the perception of maybe having more texture, but the fact that it also had a smaller sound stage says to me that maybe jitter or noise is somehow involved. Now I don't know a lot about optical, but I do understand that some DAC designers like it, some don't like it, because it has issues in the same way that coax and the same way that USB have issues. So it's not a perfect format, it's not necessarily the reference in a situation like this. I'm also not going to sit here though and say that the USB or the coax is definitively better. I'm just going to share with you what I heard in terms of a subjective differences and then you can work out if you buy one of these which one you prefer for yourself. So the optical was drier, more textural, so there's a sense of more textural detail, but it was a more compressed sound stage. I personally thought it was less enjoyable than USB, but as I said, that's going to be a personal decision. The coaxial connection was probably about the same as USB with just a touch more sense of space perhaps. Now I was using the very, very expensive high-end cable from Wave High Fidelity, the BNC and coaxial cables that I reviewed here on the channel some time ago, so there may have been some benefit from that cable. But what I can tell you is that the sound from the two was tonally very, very similar, but potentially just a touch more spacious from the coax. So for my listening preferences, I would use either USB or coax, but that's just my taste. I prefer that slightly more spacious and richer, smoother sound than the drier and more closed in sound that I heard from optical. The good news is you can choose for yourself and see what you like. While we're still here on the back panel, let's talk about the output sound quality. So I've now got a matching set of AudioQuest Yukon RCA and AudioQuest Yukon XLR cables. I connected them both up to the soloist so I could switch between the two with identical cables. The only issue is there's more power output or more voltage coming through the XLRs and therefore I had to volume match in between each switch. That made things pretty tricky when it comes to using auditory memory to identify very, very fine differences. And so I'm not going to provide a definitive statement as to the differences in sound between RCA and XLR output. What I am going to say is I feel like the XLR is just a little bit more transparent and clear compared to the RCA, but it's a very, very close thing and a small enough difference that I'm not convinced that it wasn't an artifact of the XLR being louder when I first switched over or the RCA being quiet, depending on which direction I went. So it could have just been an issue of dynamics due to volume, or it might be that the XLR is just a tiny, tiny bit cleaner and clearer. So with all that now said, let's talk about sound quality in general. The Composer is a fantastic implementation of a Sabre DAC. Now I say that because I'm generally not a huge fan of Delta Sigma DACs. I tend to like multi-bit shit DACs, R2R DACs in some cases. If you've watched my Denifrips Aries review, you'll know that I'm not always a huge fan of R2R, but when it's done right, I do like it. I'm also a fan of Chords FPGA based DACs, which technically are Delta Sigma, but have all sorts of different filtering applied. So in the case of the Composer here, it's a normal Delta Sigma based DAC using the standard filtering in the ESS Sabre chip, which is comparable, albeit different, but comparable to the AKM chip-based Delta Sigma DACs. So if you've heard a Topping D90, an RME 80i2, any of those DACs that are built on the AKM or Sabre chips, you've pretty much heard what a DAC like the Composer has to offer. That's not to say they all sound the same, it's to say that there are similarities in certain elements of the sound because they're all being produced by the same chip. 
obviously things like power supply, output stage, which filters are and aren't available, all of that can change the end experience, but you're starting with a certain cap, I guess you could say a limitation on the sound based on the fact that it's using a Delta Sigma based chip. So let's talk about what the composer is doing really well and where the limitations lie. To start with, I'm going to talk about the composer in its stock setup. So this is with the AP fast filter, and I'll talk more about the filters shortly. This is with the stock AP fast filter applied, emphasis switched off as it should be left, and using USB signal. The sound from the composer with that setup is smooth, it's resolving, it's clean, it's detailed. It's really about as good as I've heard a Delta Sigma DAC sound, in the sense that it's quite analog and smooth, but at no cost of resolution detail. It's tamed some of the in-your-faceness of the Delta Sigma sound, but at the same time, it is plagued slightly by the wall of sound approach that Delta Sigma tends to produce. And what that means is you've got a really nice width of soundstage, but not a huge amount of depth in the soundstage. Every Delta Sigma chip-based DAC that I've tried recently have all had the same problem. The challenge is in whether or not there's also harshness and edginess that comes with it, and I can comfortably say in the case of the composer, it has none of that harshness or edge. It's very smooth, it's very resolving and detailed still, but not fatiguing, not harsh, not edgy. So that's why I'm saying it's about as good an implementation as I've heard of that sort of chip. Unfortunately, I don't currently have a comparable Delta Sigma chip based DAC like say a D90 to test against the composer, but I am fairly comfortable saying that to me it's more enjoyable than the ADI2 and it's more enjoyable to me than the D90 was from Topping. But I think it's also worth talking about now the variations that the filtering can make. The AP Fast Filter, to me, did end up being my favourite through all of my testing, but I stepped through a number of them to see just how much change there was. I've traditionally found that the filters don't make a huge difference to the sound, but they will alter things slightly, such as the amount of focus of the image and the overall size of the soundstage. To me, the AP Fast Filter was the best balance of the lot, but in stepping through, the Linear Phase Fast Filter gave more of an upfront energetic sound and probably focused the image maybe just a little bit more, but at the expense of overall soundstage. Moving to Linear Phase Slow kept the sound pretty much the same as Linear Phase Fast, but just opened up the soundstage a tiny bit more. The Minimum Phase Fast brought the soundstage in even further again, but also managed to focus the sounds that are a little bit off-center a bit better. So it was almost like there was a block of sound focused here and a block of sound focused there. It's not necessarily preferable to me, but it was an interesting sound. Minimum Phase Slow was essentially the same as Minimum Phase Fast, but just softened everything a little bit. So it just blurred everything in a, in a maybe a positive way. I don't want to say positive necessarily, but it just softened everything a little bit. So there weren't as much those clear blocks of sound. Things were a little bit smoother on the edges and not quite as clearly defined. It wasn't a great sound to me. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't as good as the other options. The other options in the menu like Reserved and Brick Wall brought the soundstage right in tight and I really didn't particularly enjoy them. Ultimately for me, AP Fast did a couple of things right and I think it's why they've chosen that as the default setting for the composer and that is that it gave you a good balance between soundstage and image focus but more importantly, I think the timbral accuracy was best on AP Fast. It brought together all the best elements of each of the other filters in terms of soundstage size, image focus, and also the accuracy of the textural and timbral information that you want to hear. So some of those filters bring everything forward and make it quite energetic and direct and therefore have good textural and timbral information, while others kind of softened it out and pulled it apart a bit more into a larger soundstage, but may have lost some of that tonal accuracy. So for me, AP Fast was definitely the winner, and I can understand why they chose it. Probably my second favourite was the Linear Phase Fast, but I'd stick with AP Fast personally. Now before I start talking comparisons, there's one final thing I want to mention, and that is that this being a DSD DAC can be directly sent DSD files, or you can play back native DSD files of course. I don't have very much DSD, and the best way for me to test the performance of this with DSD was to send an upsampled PCM content using Rune as my upsampler. And what I found was that the DSD sound was just a little bit smoother and cleaner than the same track in PCM. 
It's a very minor difference and it will really come down to whether or not your system has the horsepower and the ability to do the upscaling effectively without any glitches or, or hangups in the music. If it does, DSD may be the best option to use with the composer, but it's not a huge night and day difference. It's just a minor improvement. For those wondering, I didn't try it with the M scaler because it's not really a combination that I'd specifically recommend. Where the composer excels is with DSD output. And my understanding is that the M scaler outputs an upscaled PCM signal, not DSD. So you're not gonna get the benefits of DSD. You're just gonna get the benefits of the M scaler's upsampling. To this point, you've probably got the understanding that I think the composer is a fantastic chip-based DAC and well worth considering if you're looking at others like the RME ADI2 or perhaps the Topping D90, the Gustard models, any of those DACs that are built on a Sabre or an AKM chip base, this should be definitely in your list to consider. It doesn't offer some of the functionalities such as MQA or the EQs of the ADI2. There are a few things that it doesn't have that those do, but what it does have is a fantastic power supply and probably the best output stage you're going to find in any of those DACs. The twin pairs of V6 Vivids under the hood here are going to produce one of the cleanest, most transparent sounds that you'll hear and give the best possible reproduction of the soundstage space and layering of any of the DACs that I've tried, recognizing there is a limitation, I believe, imposed by the chip itself. So now let's move over to a comparison with the shit Bifrost 2. And I should mention, if you're wondering how this performs as a preamp, I am getting to it. I haven't forgotten about it. But first, I want to look at this as DAC only versus DAC only in the Bifrost 2. So the Bifrost is a $699 US dollar DAC, making it about $500 cheaper. For that price, you're getting a much simpler device that doesn't have volume control, filtering options, any of the capabilities that this has it hasn't got Bluetooth. It's just a DAC with an XLR and an RCA output. Having said that, it also brings shit's multi-bit filters and processing into the picture. So I was keen to see how they compared, and I thought I'd set it up as a blind test, but it fell apart pretty quickly when there was no question to me which one I was listening to as I switched between the two. So I had them set up, and in my notes I've got input one and input two, and my notes going next to those points. The problem is, I very quickly knew that input one was the shit Bifrost 2. And the reason for that was that there is an immediate sense of space and depth when you're listening to what was input one, which is the Bifrost 2. And that's because of that wall of sound effect I mentioned before. No matter how many chip-based Delta Sigma DACs I listen to, I'm yet to hear one that gets away from the limitation of that wall of sound two-dimensional soundstage. Now, two-dimensional might be a bit too strong. There is a little bit of depth in the soundstage, but it's not like you hear from a chord DAC or from, say, a shit multi-bit DAC and some great R2R DACs, I'm sure, as well. There's just something in the Delta Sigma approach used by a Sabre or an AKM, and I'm sure a Cirrus Logic or a Burr Brown, they're probably all doing much the same because I think it's the Delta Sigma approach and the filtering required more so than it is the actual DAC itself. And so what I heard as I listened to the two and switched back between input one, input two, was that the Bifrost two was giving me a better sense of three dimensionality and depth in the sound. Whereas I was getting a little bit more sense of texture and detail from the composer. That doesn't mean it was giving me more information and that the Bifrost 2 was somehow throwing information away. What it meant was that the presentation, the forwardness of the presentation from the composer was giving me more kind of direct access to the detail because it was all right there. Whereas the Bifrost 2 was layering it better and making it sometimes harder to hear, but it was still in the mix, just better spaced out in terms of depth. So it's going to come down to a personal preference as to which of those presentations you like. I know for me, I like the depth of soundstage, but there'll be others who hear the two side by side and think the Bifrost 2 is lacking in detail and the composer has more detail. That's going to be personal. One thing I did notice and a reason that I do prefer the extra depth in the sound is that on a more busy track, and in this case it was Digging in the Dirt by Peter Gabriel on the new Blood Orchestral album, what I found was that when things got busy in that mix, having the extra depth in the soundstage from the Bifrost 2 allowed me to separate the sound more. I could hear different things more easily, pick them out in the mix and where they were within the orchestral space or the soundstage space, whereas in the composer, it was kind of all mashed together because it's almost on one plane. So for me, that's why I lean towards the multi-bit DAX from shit and the chord DAX is they give me a better sense of separation of the sounds. Keep in mind, that could also be a headphone thing 
versus a speaker thing. So my testing is all done with headphones. I use the speakers you can see on my desk purely for testing out things like preamp design, but I don't try to look at them from a sound staging point of view because my room is not set up properly. So for headphone listeners like me, the Bifrost 2, I believe, is a better choice unless you need the functionality of the composer, in which case I think the composer is a really great option for the price, and I would choose it personally over other options like the ADI 2 or the Topping D90. Assuming you don't need the functionality of MQA and the D90 or the EQ and other functionality that the ADI 2 offers. So you've got all three products there offering very different things. For pure sound quality, I like the Composer. So now let's talk about the stack. And by that, I mean the Composer with the soloist sitting on top of it. It's a really compelling argument for a setup you can build for under two and a half thousand US dollars that might just be an end game setup. Now limitations of the chip based DAC aside that I've already talked about to death, I do think it's a fantastic, really, really compelling system. You've got a wonderful DAC with great versatility through the filters, you've got multiple outputs you can use, and then you've got one of the best solid state amplifiers I think on the market within a price range anywhere up to what I've heard at say US dollars so far. I haven't yet heard anything within that up to $3,000 range that's been able to hold a candle to the soloist. To see just how well that stack performed, I put it up next to the TT2 behind me here. I didn't use the M scaler for this, so I bypassed the M scaler to see what the TT2 on its own would do against a cheaper stack like the Soloist and Composer. And I have to say, the Soloist and the Composer held its own pretty well, but there were clear areas where you see the benefit in spending more on something like the TT2. The TT2 did slightly better with the timbral information, getting the notes and the instruments to sound just right. It also had better bass extension and a general better sense of separation of the sounds. But it's not to suggest that the soloist and the composer were bad in that sense. It was just showing what an absolute top level system does compared to something about half the price. And I can definitely and comfortably say you're getting more than half the performance with the soloist and the composer. In fact, if I had to put a number on it, I'd probably say you're getting around 75 to 80% of the TT2 with the Soloist Composer stack. So it's a really good stack and a lot of people are going to be very, very happy with that and need nothing else. One interesting thing I did find when listening to it was that I felt like the Soloist Composer stack hit a bit harder and had a bit more punch and drive in the mid bass area. I'm not saying it enhanced it, it was more just the way it controlled the driver and presented the music, it gave a bit more punch in that mid bass area. By the way, the track I was listening to was Santiago by Oz and Matley, and it just had a bit more kind of rhythm and energy from the soloist composer compared to the TT2. The TT2 seemed to extend the bass a bit lower though, and as I've already mentioned, the timbral accuracy and the sense of spatial information was better on the TT2, as it should be for twice the price. So by this point, I was really comfortable that I think the composer is a great option, particularly for somebody that has the soloist, likes the consistent look of the two, and is looking for a fantastic system that may not be quite as good as you can get by going outside of chip-based, but if you're happy to stay in the world of chip-based DACs, I think it's a fantastic option and really, really well implemented. So my final test was to look at preamp functionality from the composer, and specifically to see if it or the soloist was the better preamp. Now as part of my testing, it's worth mentioning one little issue I found, and that is that if you're using the two of these together and you're using the remote control, when you try to change the input on the composer, so let's say you're going from USB to coaxial, unfortunately it is going to affect the soloist at the same time. So it's a bit annoying because it's going to mean the soloist flips over to RCA from XLR or vice versa when you're trying to move from say USB to coax or Bluetooth, whatever you might be using. So if you're regularly flicking through devices, that could be a bit of an issue, and also because you can't exactly tape over the input for the remote control on the soloist, because then you're going to lose volume control. So it's a bit of an issue in that regard, and something that I think needs to be fixed by Burson, maybe with different remote controllers for both, or different buttons for DAC source versus amp source, I'm not quite sure, but that is a slight issue for me. Beyond that though, they're a really wonderful pairing, and so I continued by checking out the preamp capabilities. A big part of this is how the volume controls are implemented. In the case of the composer, it's using the onboard volume control within the Sabre chip, which is lossless, so you're not losing any sound quality as you do it, but it's not a level of sophistication like the volume control in the Soloist, which is really, really top-notch and is part of why the Soloist is just so transparent. 
what I immediately noticed when moving between the two, and for this test I was using the XLRs out of the composer into the KRK G5 version 4s, or directly out of the soloist fed by the composer into the KRKs, what I found was that the soloist was clearly more resolving and transparent as a preamp. The sound from the composer was a little bit thicker and a little bit smoother. Now personally for me, it felt like I was losing out on resolution when I was using the composer, but on some systems, the extra bit of warmth from the composer is going to be beneficial. So again, I'm not going to say definitively that the composer is worse, they're just different. The composer is a lesser resolving system, but it's still very, very good, and the bit of extra warmth may be really beneficial in some setups. One of the tracks I was using for this testing was Free by Rudimental. And I was also chatting to a patron at the time who'd mentioned some chat over on HeadFi about the combination of the composer in preamp mode and using the soloist with its volume bypassed being a better solution than using the composer in DAC mode, so with fixed volume, and then the volume control on the soloist. So I checked that as well. And using that track free by Rudimental, it became really obvious to me that the sound out of the composer was actually overdoing the bass. It was a bit too warm for me compared to what I heard from the soloist. So to my mind, unless you actually need the extra warmth and bass from the composer, if you're pairing it up with the soloist, I actually don't see any benefit in using the composer as the volume control. It's got a lower quality volume control and it's reducing the resolution of your system. It might be good if you're driving some leaner headphones like say HD800s, but I don't really see any other benefit in using the composer as the volume control. If you're looking for a preamp and you've already got a DAC, don't replace your DAC and buy a composer, get yourself a soloist. If you're looking for a DAC that is also a fantastic preamp, then the composer definitely should be on your list. In isolation, it's a wonderful preamp with a great quality output, it's just not as good as the soloist because the soloist is just on another level. So to bring all this to a close, what you can probably tell by now is that I'm not quite as enamored with the composer as I am with the soloist. I still think the soloist is one of the very best products on the market today, whereas I think the composer is a very good product. I think it's an excellent chip-based DAC, I think it's limited by the fact that it is a chip-based DAC, but it's doing the absolute best that you can with that foundation. To me it's a preferable choice over some of the other options I've already mentioned, and if anyone's looking for a DAC in that $1,000 range and you need it to have functionality like preamp control, you want access to filters, maybe you need Bluetooth, you should absolutely take a look at the Composer, I think it's a brilliant brilliant option. Once again, I want to say a huge thanks to Burson for sending the composer over for me to review. As always, there's no kickbacks or anything involved in this. It's just an opportunity for me to share more products with you, and I thank them for providing that opportunity. I will put a link down below, so if this sounds like a good deck for you, you can go through, read up more on it, and find out where and how you can buy it. I know if you're outside Australia, you can buy direct from Burson. If you're within Australia, then I think you need to go through their distributors here. But either way, I'll leave the link there, and you can find out more. As always, I hope you found this review useful. If you have, I'd love it if you'd hit the subscribe button and of course the like button as well to get this video in front of more people just like you. For now though, I'll leave you to the music, so happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.